world war that we're now facing is intense, brutal, very expensive and very damaging to the economies of all the country, all the countries concerned. But let's um, first of all deal with the elephant in the room, the question of the war in the Ukraine. Uh, just be clear for the record, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is completely wrong under any circumstances. It cannot be supported in any way, and I absolutely do not do that. I want to see peace within the region and want to see ultimately demilitarization within the region. And the Russian invasion has obviously put all of those objectives way back. However, hundreds of thousands of people are living in desperate circumstances. Many have died. Many are now refugees across the rest of the world, but mainly across Europe. And uh, the um, effects on Ukraine are obviously devastating, but the effects also on young Russians who are being um, conscripted into the army and many losing their lives in this war is obviously huge as well. So our support has to go out to the peace campaigners in Russia, just as much as we would send our solidarity to peace campaigners all over the world. But there has to be some way of um, breaking the deadlock, bring about a process that can ultimately lead to a peaceful settlement of the, all of the issues. And it is the failure of the United Nations to engage properly with Russia um, at the very beginning of this that is has to be looked at. It is the um, issue of who will be an interlocutor now. And I think there are some interesting signs around the world. Whilst Europe and North America, our <clears throat> media is very strongly and in very great detail reporting every aspect of the war in the Ukraine, <clears throat> the rest of the world um, is looking at it um, in many sort of rather different ways. And I've been um, over the last year three or four times in Latin America and the discussions there are of a very different order they want to see peace they do not want to see a polarization of the world into a new cold war and I get the feeling that the new progressive presidents that um, populate Latin America albeit all of them under pressure from very powerful right-wing forces in their own countries um, do want to play a part in this and so I think we should uh, hope that um, there can be some movement uh, from both African countries and Latin American countries to try to broker a talks, broker a ceasefire, and broker ultimately a some kind of settlement of this issue. We should be doing we should be doing that. And uh, as I've said many many times, and I should imagine everyone in this call would agree, the actions of Russia are wrong. But there has to be a way forward that doesn't continue this destruction of um, of the eastern part of Ukraine, but also the damage to so many people in Russia. There is also um, the back behind this, the issue of nuclear weapons. Uh, Russia is obviously a nuclear armed state. The NATO um, countries that uh, surround Ukraine and go right up to the borders of Russia, all of them have, because of NATO membership in nuclear facility, and the ever-present danger of the whole thing tipping over into a nuclear conflict are very, very serious indeed. And so when people tell me that this is not the time to raise these issues in Parliament, it's not the time to talk about peace. If you can't talk about peace at a time of war, then when can you talk about peace? So I do think we have to uh, <clears throat> promote the idea of some kind of um, peaceful um, movement on the issue of Ukraine. On the slightly wider issue of the renewed Cold War in the world, take ourselves back a moment to um, 1990, 1991. That was a time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. It was the breakup of the Warsaw Pact. It was a time of um, taunt with Russia. There were numbers of agreements reached about the reduction of nuclear warheads and ballistic missiles and so on. And it was a time 
of some hope and it should have been used at a time of the most enormous opportunities i remember bruce kent and i discussing this many times um, both ourselves one-to-one -one, but also at the numerous meetings that we held at that time that this was the great opportunity for a um a reduction in arms expansion and peace process around the world unfortunately that wasn't necessarily seized off the arms manufacturers continued their um, campaign of um, uh, selling more and more arms and boosting the arms arms trade i'll come back to that a little bit later i want to come to the end of my remarks that um that opportunity was not seized and instead we've had a period now of um, 30 years of continuous nato expansion um increasing arms expenditure and of course the um opposite happens in russia with increase in arms expenditure and um in increase in weapons production and so the danger gets greater and greater we also have this concept that um the world has to be led by the United States and uh, therefore anyone that's seen as a rival to the United States in any way is somehow or other de facto a rival to all of us and potentially an enemy. And so this leads to the thinking which gives us the um, uh, pact with um, the UK, USA and Australia um AUKUS pact which um potentially brings um nuclear weapons into australia and to the south china sea as a rival with china and britain has already started deploying the navy um, in the south china sea which is the first time that the navy has been seriously deployed east of suez since the 1960s when harold wilson at least managed to withdraw britain from an east of suez policy we seem to be going back into a global role and that again leads to a growing tension uh, with a cold war between china and much of the rest of the world between russia and western europe and the united states and a growing alliance between russia and china but the interesting thing is the rest of the world is not necessarily siding with um, um europe and, U and the usa on this the rest of the world basically wants to be able to trade with peoples in all parts of the world and obviously in the case of africa desperately needs the huge amounts of grain that are produced by ukraine and the west and the western provinces of russia in order to be able to sustain the food supplies in their own country so this has to be an opportunity i think for the voice of um latin america and um africa to take center stage in the development of um world political processes um so in the issues that this world faces at the moment post pandemic has indicated just how um, unequal the um, living standards of many people are across the world post cop indicates just how dangerous and devastating climate change is and the uh, poverty of many people in southern countries and what they face as a result of climate change um, and exploitation of their natural resources by western countries so if we're to deal with the real issues that affect the world poverty inequality injustice climate change and potential of another pandemic um, different different disease different illness or whatever covid then we have to have um, some degree of solidarity across the planet in terms of food supplies environmental protection um, and of course access to um, medicines and health services those have to be the correct priorities in the case of our own country uh, we uh, were committed to 1.5 percent of um, expenditure going on um, defense that was increased to two percent and the government now has uh, as they describe it an aspiration to put that increase up to three percent and think about that that is a half in a 50 percent increase in defense expenditure planned over the next uh, 
decade or so. And so we'll become one of the biggest spenders on defence budgets of uh, Western Europe, and indeed um, one of the, the top ones in the world. And that also means, leads us into being one of the biggest investors in the arms industry and one of the biggest exporters of armaments around the world. And through the Peace and Justice Project, we are um, publishing a significant piece of research and book next year. Um, this year rather um on the um on the arms trade and the effects of it and we've been listening to a lot of global voices in all parts of the world on this and then the more one sort of reads it and hears from it and talks about it you just think of all the brilliance that goes into making highly sophisticated weapons how much of that brilliance could be better used on um, medicine education environmental protection and all the other issues that actually face this world and so it is a very important time to ha <clears throat> have a serious and significant voice for peace now um how we communicate with each other is very very important and the role of our media in both their reporting of conflict and other conflicts around the world are important well, think about this I've said quite a lot about Ukraine. I'm sure everyone in this call would um, have their own views and want to say something about the war in Ukraine. It's not the only war going on in the world at the present time. There is serious conflict, albeit a ceasefire, temporary, but I hope it becomes permanent, in Yemen. What has fueled that war other than the export of arms to the UAE and to Saudi Arabia? by Britain and the United States, uh, more by Britain actually in many cases than the United States. There is a serious conflict going on in the Congo. At the heart of that conflict is actually access to the mineral riches of the Congo. There are serious conflicts going on in Ethiopia, both internal and the dangers of external conflict between um, Ethiopia and neighboring countries. There are serious conflicts going on in many places around the world there are enormous injustices around the world through occupation i've said the occupation the russian occupation of ukraine is wrong the israeli occupation of the west bank is equally wrong the israeli bombardment of gaza is equally wrong and the consequences of wars are damage to food supplies are damage to the world's economy and a huge flow of refugees Yesterday, when I got back um, last night, I went to visit um, Calais to see for myself with um, uh, my good friend Bel Rivero Addy, MP for Streatham, and others to um, meet people who are working supporting refugees in Calais and to see the conditions under which those refugees are trying to survive. Well, let's put it this way. Calais has become a militarized town with um, barbed wire alongside the roads, um, walls it's impossible to climb anywhere near where a lorry goes, a massive um, security protective infrastructure all around the port and the channel tunnel entrances, and police cars patrolling the whole time to harass any refugees who make it to Calais. The only safe place they have to go is the Caritas Day Center funded by the Catholic Church, which is open every day for refugees to go into, uh, charge their phones and try and get some sort of peace. And the huge efforts been put in by volunteers to provide food and clothing and support, which is what we went to visit yesterday and provide that for them. And now these people are very, very desperate. They're not criminals, they're not enemies, they're just desperate people trying to survive. And where have they come from? Start talking to them. Where have they come from? They've come from Afghanistan, they've come from Syria, they've come from Libya, they've come from Iraq, they've come from Iran. They've always, for that matter, Ethiopia, Eritrea and so on, every single place they've come from, there is either a conflict going on fueled by armed supplies and demands for natural resources or a, an abuse of human rights in many cases both things are going on 
and our media present these people as some kind of invasion threat to us. In reality, the numbers of people coming are about the same as those that attend a, a championship football match on a, on a weekly basis. That's a number coming every year. And uh, the government's response is to try to send them to Rwanda um, to uh, essentially make sure they don't ever set foot in this country or are able to stay in this country. And so when we challenge the un unhuman approach by our government and the Home Office, we're also challenging, I think, the narrative that uh, you'll deal with the world's problems by barbed wire, electronic surveillance and increased arms supplies. No, you won't. You'll just end up spending more money on more barbed wire, more surveillance and more arms in the long run. It has to be the narrative of peace that we put forward. Our media are not putting forward that narrative of peace, indeed barely reporting it, indeed denigrating anyone that ever dares to talk about peace. CND was founded at the height of the Cold War in the 1950s, 1957, and uh, CND grew during the period of the Cuba Missile Crisis in 1962, grew during the period when um, Western Europe, uh, led by the United States, rearmed with um, Trident missiles in the 1980s. And um, we also grew alongside Stop the War and others in the campaign against the Iraq War. And so whilst the media the mainstream media for the most part buy into the idea that you can divide the world up into convenient military power blocks and uh, have a sort of um, uh, armed uh, armed truce if you like um, between the, the big power blocks there are many people who simply do not buy into that and believe that the world's resources could and should be better used on the big issues that we face and that's where the alternative media are so important and challenging the mainstream media and through it's up here you can see it behind me through the peace and justice project we're promoting news clubs around the country to develop an alternative source of news and bring together those not to take anybody over absolutely not more to facilitate um all those very interesting and important alternative news sites that do provide that uh, that message which is very very different and it is about us who've been in the peace movement all of our lives making sure that we do reach out to people to give that alternative voice and embolden pay people who might be living in communities where that is very very difficult our media report um, heavily about ukraine understandably in many ways but absolutely fail to report the other conflicts or other crises in the world and almost never give the story of the um, bravery of, of individual refugees who try to make their way to a place of safety in a very difficult world history is not going to be kind to the politicians of the early part of the 21st century who knowing full well how dangerous the uh, climate change issue is, knowing full well how dangerous the question of another pandemic is around the world, chose instead to um, go into conflict rather than search for a role of peace and redistribution of wealth and power in the world. Um, I'm going to talk about the new Cold War and its implications for us now. So bear with me, I'm going to go over material pretty swiftly. I hope it's as clear as possible. Over the course of the past 15 years, European countries have found themselves with both great opportunities to seize and complex choices to make. Unsustainable reliance on the United States for trade and investment, as well as the very curious distraction of Brexit led to the steady integration of European countries with Russian energy markets and more uptake of Chinese investment opportunities and its manufacturing prowess. Closer linkages between Europe and these two large Asian countries, China and Russia, provoked the US agenda to prevent that integration or delay it. This agenda has created great instability for the world. It has led to war in Ukraine and is provoking a war in the South China Sea. 
This process of the historical integration of Europe and Asia goes back to the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, which was spurred on by the collapse of the United States housing market and several key US financial institutions. The crisis signaled to the rest of the world that the US centered financial system was untrustworthy. The US could not remain the market of last resort for the world's commodities. The group of seven countries, which saw themselves as the guardians of the global capitalist system, begged states outside their orbit, such as India and China, to put their surpluses into the Western financial system to prevent its total meltdown. And I want to emphasize that word. They begged India and China. When India had a balance of payments shortfall in 1991, the Bank of England demanded that India airlift gold to London in order to get a bridge loan. No such demand could be made by the, Fed, the Reserve Bank of India in Bombay or the banks in China that British and US gold must come as the surety. Well, in return for the service of providing liquidity to Western financial markets, countries outside the G7 were told that from now on, the G20 would be the executive body of the world system and the G7 would gradually disband. Yet, 20 years later, the G7 remains in place and has arrogated to itself the role of world leader with NATO, the Trojan horse of the United States, now positioning itself as the world's policeman. And after NATO's involvement in Libya, one should not um, be too sanguine about this phrase, world's policeman. What right did NATO have to bomb Libya? I'm not sure. There was no charter obligation, and yet it involved itself there. In June of 2022, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said that the organization will undergo the largest overhaul of its collective deterrence and defense since the Cold War. The NATO member states, now with the addition of Finland and Sweden, will expand their high readiness force from 40,000 troops to 300,000 troops who equipped with a range of lethal weaponry will be, and this is the quote, ready to deploy to specific territories on the alliance's eastern flank, namely the Russian border. This was said in June of 2022. The United Kingdom's new chief of the general staff, General Sir Patrick Sanders, said that these armed forces should prepare to fight and win in a war against Russia. Think about how these statements were received in Moscow and then, of course, in a knock-on effect in Beijing. With the tensions around Ukraine, it was obvious that NATO would foreground Russia at its July 2022 Madrid summit. But the material, materials produced by NATO made it clear that this was not merely about Ukraine or Russia, but about preventing Eurasian integration. China was mentioned for the first time in a NATO document at the 2019 London meeting, in which it was said that China presented both opportunities and challenges. By 2021, the tune had changed, and NATO's Brussels summit concluded it started accusing China of systematic challenges to the rules-based international order. I'm not going to get into this idea of the rules-based international order, but the institute I direct, Tricontinental, will have a dossier on this in March about the idea of the rules-based international order. The revised 2022 strategic concept of NATO accelerates this threatening rhetoric with accusations that China's systematic competition challenges our interests, security, and values, and seeks to undermine the rules-based international order. This was the rhetoric, or this is the rhetoric, of the US-imposed new Cold War on Eurasia. The new Cold War was developed to solve two problems by military means 
that the United States could not solve by commerce alone. First, the US could not block the emergence of Chinese high tech in telecommunications, in robotics, in high speed rail, in green tech. And since it could not block this emergence by commercial means, it sought to prevent Chinese commerce by using extra economic force. Now you in the United Kingdom will be familiar with this around the attempt to block, successful attempt to block Huawei from bringing its 5G technology into the UK. Not by commercial means, getting better 5G technology for the UK, which you desperately need, but by getting a military or diplomatic, or in this case, accusations of espionage and so on. Second, the US elites felt that Europe's reliance upon Russian energy due to the West's stupid wars against Iraq and Libya and its near war against Iran had meant that the Atlantic Alliance might wither and Europe might look to the East for its anchor. To prevent these developments, the United States has been willing to risk the Earth system, annihilation rather than the end of US domination. Four non-NATO countries, Australia, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea, the so-called Asia Pacific Four, attended the 2022 NATO summit for the first time, which drew them closer to the US and NATO agenda to put pressure on China. Australia and Japan, along with India and the United States, are part of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or Quad, often called the Asian NATO, whose clear mandate is to constrain China's partnership in the Pacific Rim area. The Asia Pacific Four held a meeting during the NATO summit to discuss military cooperation against China, erasing any doubt about the intentions of NATO and its allies. Chafing at the bullying attitude of the West regarding the war in Ukraine, India has decided to go its own way. Whether this could mean greater Indian involvement in BRICS and a new non-alignment should not be exaggerated. India, after all, has its own problems with China. In the wake of the revelations of the 2007-08 financial crisis and the Group of Seven's broken promises, the Chinese adopted two pathways to gain more independence from the US consumer market. First, they improved the Chinese domestic market by increasing social wages, integrating China's Western provinces into the economy and abolishing absolute poverty. Second, they built trade development and financial systems that were not centered around the United States. The Chinese participated actively with Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa to set the BRICS process in motion in 2009 and put considerable resources into the One Belt, One Road and now Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. China and Russia settled a long-standing border dispute, enhanced their cross-border trade and developed a strategic collaboration. But unlike the West, did not formulate a military treaty. This is very important. NATO is a military alliance, not merely a security understanding. China and Russia do not have a military alliance. They have merely a security understanding. In other words, if one is attacked, the other does not have to enter the war. Thank God for that, by the way. During this period, Russia, Russian energy sales to both China and Europe grew, and several European countries joined the BRI, which increased mutual investments between Europe and China. Earlier forms of globalization in Eurasia were limited by colonialism and the earlier Cold War. This marked the first time in 200 years that integration began to take place on an equitable foundation across the region. Europe's trade and investment choices were utterly rational as piped natural gas through Nord Stream 2 was far cheaper and less dangerous for the climate than liquefied natural gas from the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Mexico. Considering the chaotic Brexit situation and difficulties in getting the transatlantic trade and investment partnership off the ground, you can thank Boris Johnson for both, much of Europe saw Chinese investment opportunities as far more generous and de dependable than other alternatives. In contrast, 
risk averse and rent seeking private equity from Wall Street became less attractive in the European financial sector. Europe was drift drifting inexorably toward Asia, which threatened the basis of the US dominated economic and political system, that so called rules based international order. In 2018, US President Donald Trump publicly chastised NATO Stoltenberg, telling him, we're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting all of these countries. And then numerous of these countries go out and make a pipeline deal with Russia, where they're paying billions of dollars into the coffers of Russia. Germany is captive of Russia. I think it's very inappropriate. That was Donald Trump. While NATO's language has turned to threats of war against China and Russia, the G7 has pledged to challenge China's led initiative by developing the new Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, a $200 billion fund to invest in the Global South. Meanwhile, the leaders at the BRICS summit, held at the same time as the NATO summit, offered a sober appraisal of the times, calling for negotiations to end the war in Ukraine and measures to be taken to stem the cascading crisis experienced by the world's poor, including in Europe. There was no talk of war from this body, which represents 40% of the world's population. The G7 merely represents 10% of the world's population. The US and its allies seek either to remain hegemonic and weaken China and Russia, or to erect a new iron curtain around these two countries. Both approaches could lead to a suicidal military conflict. The mood around the global south is for a far more measured acceptance of the reality of Europe and Asia integrating and the emergence of a world order based on national and regional sovereignty and for the dignity of all human beings, none of which can be realized through war and division. This war in Ukraine must end. It can only end with negotiations. The West blocked the interim deal reached in March of last year in Turkey. The West continues to block the possibility of negotiations. The peace movement in the West must insist on an end to the war. It is strange to see people of decency frothing at the mouth, insisting on regime change in Russia, which is a dangerous fantasy. The great Pakistani Marxist poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz wrote decades ago about a sensation that seems to capture our time now. Wo padi hai roz when catastrophe visits us every day, what fear remains for the apocalypse? Thanks a lot. I'm going to be talking about um, our government and others, of course, prioritizing the genocide button um, over, over um, the, the need to feed people who are starving. Um, but before I do that, I just want to talk very briefly about the report we had yesterday about terminal cancer among Grenfell firefighters, which was terrifying and our community is, is very shaken by it because we were all there too. And um, while this report relates to the um, 1300 firefighters who were there and uh, possibly 11,000 um, close station neighbors, including myself, and I've had cancer and recovered since the fire. Um, this is horrible, but it made us think really about the effects of a of nuclear bomb um, and the deaths of, at the time of impact, and then the painful and lingering deaths that happen over many, many years afterwards and possibly into future generations and the impact of that, and it's unconscionable. And yet our government is willing to pay for a million grandfalls elsewhere, of course, not in our country, with millions dying at the time and uh, potentially uh, devastating entire cities and cultures. Um, and then subsequently the spread of lingering deaths of many, many more in the years to come. The social cost alone of nuclear war is indefensible. Despite this, the inevitable loss of tens, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of lives and the potential of more death by cancer and other related diseases, um, our government is hell-bent on spending billions on replacing Trident. We have a, a country 
facing an epidemic um, of flu while we're still battling the pandemic of COVID, which is spreading again, as we know. Um, recession, NHS, the shameful state of our damp, mold-ridden housing stock. So many ways to die which are avoidable if only the money was put in the right place. This is financial neglect. Um, we could cure all that by prioritizing life over death. So there are estimates here of the CND of uh, procuring new submarines, leasing missiles. We lease, I didn't know we leased missiles, good grief. So much for sovereignty, hey? Servicing and decommissioning um, and all those costs um, of um, Trident have been estimated as a jaw dropping 205 billion pounds. And just think, just think what we could do with that money as Jeremy was referring to earlier, all the things that we could tackle um, with, with that and put our country on track. Obviously, number one, we would have to boost the NHS and put people back in the in the you know in the res respected good terms and conditions and pay to keep people in the NHS and attract more people into the NHS. Tackling climate change, which I think the government is doing in an entirely tokenistic way, um, are failures which are growing in education. Um, uh, funding our incredible scientists um, to deal with our, our failures um, in, in technology, um, health, the environment, and so on. So <laughs> we aren't just spending unnecessarily on rearming this genocide button. We're also failing to recycle high-tech assets, and that's the decommissioned submarines which are sitting around. They're actually worth quite a lot if they're recycled, and they're sitting there. We have, I think, 20 which are in storage and about five out and about um, active, um, which I, I've done some sums on this. This may be dodgy, and I'm happy for anyone to challenge me on this. But if you look at the, um, the number of uh, warheads um, and their capacity to kill and the a multiplier of the of the um, capacity to kill of um, Hiroshima. Um, this may be wrong, but I worked out about 179 million people um, are at risk of being killed by the warheads that we have in our four or is it five nuclear submarines. 179 million, and that's about four European countries. And I just find that shocking. And <laughs> of course, we do know that high tech. Um, Equipment is uh, subject to anomalies, as we know from this, the rocket launch of the satellites earlier this week. So we can't trust any, uh, anyone to be safe. And if that is our capacity, uh, while people are starving, and I heard a story yesterday of somebody arriving at a food bank who collapsed from starvation with her two children, poor woman, she, she was so hungry, she, she collapsed and had to, to be resuscitated. And that's that's the country we're in. And even in fabulous Kensington, we have the poorest neighborhood in the whole of London and our food banks running out of, of food. Um, meanwhile, of course, a quarter of our defense budget is spent on potential genocide. While our veterans are homeless, um, some living on the street uh, with PTSD and multiple problems. Military accommodation is absolutely shocking. And somebody said recently, um, there's a potential military grandfall from some of the uh, some of the blocks that the, the military are living in. Um, as we know, mental health, bullying and suicide is common and increasing because they're underfunded and um, poorly managed. So our government priorities are completely insane and impractical. Um, if we if we were to take the 140 odd thousand people who work in defense in the UK, um, diversifying their skills, um, could lead us to completely refocus our industrial capacity. And, and there could be you know, innumerable benefits for us. And one of them, of course, will be tackling cyber warfare. Look what's just happened to the Royal Mail. We have no idea how that was done, and that was possibly Russia. Russia is more interested in cyber warfare, which has completely disabled Royal Mail, and I'm not sure where we are with that today, uh, with their ransomware attack. Um, and we are um, in, in completely incapable because we don't have the technical capacity to tackle that. So we should be focusing our funding and our ingenuity and protecting what we have um, and rescale and redeploy some of our defense employees into um, health giving uh, positive industries uh, which protect our, our communities. Um, you know, the climate we're living in, as Jennifer was saying earlier, about the, the toxic masculinity um, um, of 
of countries, of course, of our government, which is horrific. Look at what has been normalized now. And of course, you know, the cost of living crisis, which is actually a cost of the Tories crisis. Let's be very clear about that. It's a cost of Tories crisis that we're facing while racism, um, homophobia, misogyny is uh, now being normalized. We need to keep these Tories who are desperate. They're going to lose the next election. Uh, what will they? What would they do? What would they do to actually regain a few points? Would they? Would they go somewhere near the genocide button, or would even threaten to do? It? We need to keep them well away from that that potential. We need to keep profiteering out of war. We've heard a lot about that already today, um, and we had to stop the arms industry salivating over Ukraine and its so-called opportunities, which I find sickening. We need to scrap Trident, we all know that. We need to feed people and we need to make profit from peace and not war. Thank you. Uh, the peace movement is so important and arguably it is now more important than, uh, than it has been for quite a while because as many of you will know, the US have added uh, the UK uh, RAF Lakenheath base to their list of weapons storage and security systems that opening up the possibility for US nuclear weapons to come to the UK. I'll repeat that. The US have added a, a UK uh, RAF base to their list of, of, of bases that could potentially have US nuclear weapons. There used to be uh, American nuclear, nuclear weapons in the UK. Uh, we had them in the RAF Lakenheath base just an hour drive from where I am now in Cambridge. They had them in Suffolk. Um, they had around 110 gravity bombs uh, at the turn of the century. Why did they go? Uh, because of a consistent peace move, uh, movement uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. Pressure got so much that in 2008, America was forced to take uh, to get rid of their nuclear gravity bombs from UK soil. And that was a huge achievement for the peace movement. It was the first time since 1954 that US nuclear weapons were not present on UK soil. And now, unfortunately, it seems that we have regressed. And now there is the possibility for nuclear, US nuclear weapons to come to the UK. Uh, now that Lake Neath has been re-added to that list, uh, that they, they are set to receive 24 F-35 Air A warplanes. And just last November, the US Air Force updated their safety rules to allow for the latest B-6112 nukes to be transported to bases across the US and Europe. So that means two things. Either, number one, that the latest B-61 nukes could be coming to UK soil to be flown around by F-35 A, A warplanes. Number two, it could mean that nuclear weapons that are already in in the Europe in American bases that they have there could be coming to the UK, and so this could enable for American nuclear weapons to easily move across the continent. Both of those uh, possibilities are terrible news. And the first of all, just from an environmental point point of view, look, the US military is the single biggest polluter in the country, and we in the UK want nothing to do with that. We want nothing to do with that in the East Angular. Look, the amount of emissions that an F-35 air warplane like, produces compared to the amount of emissions that I produce or you produce, it's just not comparable. Like for someone to lecture the ordinary individual on how they need to have shorter showers and use less, use less plastic and use the car less, and then to allow, and then to like support America bringing nukes to our country. Like it's a mathematical in, in nonsense. It just doesn't add up. And, if nuclear weapons, if American nuclear weapons and, and F-35 air warplanes come to Lake and Heath in the UK, it will increase air pollution, it will increase sound pollution, it will harm the local environment, it will radically increase CO2 emissions. We are in a climate crisis, a climate and ecological crisis. We want nothing to do with that in East Angola. Quite frankly, we don't want that sort of stuff anywhere in the world. And the other point, the other point about this, like from an international relations point of view, bringing nu like nuclear weapons anywhere is a terrible thing. But the latest American nuclear te technology on UK soil in 2023, when there is a war between Russia and Ukraine, and we are sanctioning Russia, it's insanity, right? Like recently, Biden came out and he said that we are the closest to nuclear war since the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, like, why are you making it worse? Like, this is not what we need. What we what we need right now is radical de-escalation. We need some sincere and honest and open negotiations and proper mature talk between the powers that be and we need we need to find a, a proper compromise where the people of ukraine can feel can feel a right to self-determination and can feel a sense of security and a sense of safety and 
and look, every, and I know there are more complications. I know like people have their blood on their hands, but every war has had to end with negotiations. Like World War, World War I, you had the British imperialists and the Germans both had blood on their hands, both had but terrible, terrible people. They still had to have negotiations. They still had to find some form of compromise. Why can't we have the negotiations now and avoid any more bloodshed? And people might say at this point, oh, you're just a special snowflake, are you? Look, nuclear war is no joke. Nuclear war is no joke. One mistake is all it takes for disaster. And it's just too serious a threat to play, to play around with. It's too serious to gamble with. This is not an overreaction. We need a radical de-escalation of tensions. And what America is doing to bring, to open up the possibility for nuclear weapons to come to the UK, it is the exact opposite to what we need to be doing. It is making the world more, a more dangerous place. It is making the, more, it is making, uh, the threat of nuclear war more uh, da dangerous. It is the exact wrong thing to be doing, and we want nothing to do with it in the UK. So we have to stand up for this. Now, with that uh, context, I want to say a message um, to the people in the audience. First of all, to the fellow young people like myself, I know that we are in some very complex and dismal times. There are so many issues to be thinking about, and there is not a lot of hope right now. Time, it's not easy uh, right now. Things are not easy right now, but we have to do something about this. We have to dedicate at least a bit of our time to this issue because it is so important. And the, and the one, one thing about this is it's a serious issue and barely anyone is talking about it. You don't see any of the sort of stuff in the mainstream media. You don't see any of the sort of stuff in the, being talked by the zeitgeist. We have to be the ones who educate ourselves about this issue and then educate other uh, other people around us about this issue. We have to get the conversation going about, about this, uh, these, these tensions and this move for nuclear weapons in the UK. We have to be the people, be the voice of reason in, the, in this crisis. And I wanna say something to the old, older people in the room who have been involved in this um, a campaign for much longer than us. I know it must be so disheartening to see this reversal of all the work you've done. You've worked so hard to get you American nukes out of British, out of British territory. And now there's a possibility that they might be coming back and it must be so uh, dispiriting. But look, the tide of warmongering and uh, insanity is always going to be coming back up the beach and we just have to be consistently standing against it stopping stopping it from getting too too ridiculous and if we can revitalize this campaign and pass on that baton to a fresh generation and then keep keep that structure steady to avoid to avoid that that nonsense uh causing damage that that's our purpose and it won't be easy it will not be easy like um the amount of backlash we're receiving is incredible at the moment. Like last in last year's uh, commemoration for Hiroshima and Nagasaki that I held in Cambridge, I had someone come up to me uh, saying, oh, if you hate America and the West so much, why don't you go and live in Russia and then decide how much you want to criticize the, with the West? I, I'm sorry, first of all, no, I lived, I, I was born in this country. I've lived in this country all my life. I like this country a lot. There's a lot of things that I like, I like about living in the West. That doesn't mean I have to be patriotic. That doesn't mean I have to blindly worship and follow everything that the West does. I enslave myself to number the Lord of the heavens and the earth who sent down a moral conduct. And if you break morality, if you cause bloodshed, if you call, if you bring humanity to a, a, a greater risk of destruction, I'm going to stand up to you. I don't care who or where in the world you are. I will stand up to bloodshed. I will stand up to immorality. I will stand up to dangerous things like like nuclear war, who regardless of who's of who cause of who is committing these crimes, I will stand up to infringement of freedom of speech in Russia, just as I will stand up to infringement on freedom of speech in the West. I will stand up to the marginalization and the slandering of peace activists in the West, and I will oppose all rising of tensions, be it from Putin or from America. And so we will we are going to stand up to this to this dangerous move to bring nuclear weapons to the UK. So I want everyone in the in this in the audience to pledge uh, number one to go to Lake and Heath. If you can't make that pledge to go to Lake and Heath and protest, then pledge to support CND's protest outside the U.S. Embassy. If you can't make that pledge, if you can't uh, make that pledge to go to that protest, then pledge to donate at least something to peace activism. If you can't make that pledge, then at least pledge to educate yourself and educate those around you. In the gloom of mighty cities, with the roar of whirling wheels, we are toiling on like chattel slaves for old. And our masters hope to keep us ever thus beneath their heels, and to coin our very lifeblood into gold. But we have a glowing dream of how fair the world will seem, when we all can live our lives secure and free. 
When the earth is owned by labour and there's joy and peace for all In the commonwealth of toil that is to be As cowed and beaten, cringing meekly at their feet, they would stand between each toiler and his bread. Shall we yield our lives up to them for the bitter crust we eat? Shall we only hope for heaven when we're dead? For we have a glowing dream of how fair the world will seem when we all can live our lives secure and free. When the earth is owned by labour and there's joy and peace for all In the commonwealth of toil that is to be They have laid our lives out for us to the utter end of time Shall we stagger on beneath their heavy load? Shall we let them live forever in their gilded halls of crime With our children doomed to toil beneath their gold? For we have a glowing dream of how fair the world will seem When we all can live our lives secure and free When the earth is owned by labour and there's joy and peace for all In the commonwealth of toil that is to be is all triumphant and we claim our mother earth and the nightmare of the present fades away we shall live with love and laughter we who now a little worth and will not regret the price we have to pay for we have a glowing dream of how fair the world will seem when we all can live our lives secure and free when the earth is owned by labour and there's joy and peace for all In the commonwealth of toil that is to be In the commonwealth of toil that is to be uh, It's a pleasure to join uh, another campaign for a nuclear disarmament meeting, especially this weekend. This is the weekend when we celebrate the birth of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And there are many actions taking place uh, across the country in his honor. Uh, King should best be known for his uncompromising stance on peace. Uh, one year before he was assassinated, one year to the day, he publicly broke with uh, President Lyndon Johnson and opposed the war in Vietnam in a scathing uh, uh, statement. Uh, he was vilified, of course, including by the people who now claim to revere his memory. It's a difficult holiday because all the war makers give speeches and claim to uh, respect him so much. A at any case, but thank you to the organizers for uh, their work in putting this together and for inviting me to participate. Uh, and I'm speaking on the subject of U.S. nuclear exploitation in the global south. Um, what role do nuclear programs play in that part of the world? Most people do not know that the nuclear weapon dropped on Hiroshima in 1945 was made from uranium that was mined from the Congo, which was then a Belgian colony. Uh, Belgium had been occupied by Germany, and the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA, was anxious to secure uranium in Belgium's colony and secured an agreement with the Belgian government in exile uh, uh, in, to, to do just that. Africa is still the source of much uranium, particularly in the nation of Niger, in the run-up to the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, much of the war propaganda making the case for aggression focused on a claim that Saddam Hussein was trying to secure uh, Nigerian uranium. Uh, the Bush George W. Bush administration went very far in this effort, uh, but the UN's International Atomic 
energy agency immediately knew that the documents that the U.S. presented were forged, uh, very badly forged with outdated letterhead and signatures from departed officials. But the U.S. and its allies, such as the U.K., persisted in making false claims about uh, Iraq um, uh, and uh, this charge that uh, Saddam Hussein was trying to get uranium. Uh, we should point out uh, that uh, Niger's uranium mining is in the hands of French corporations. As with uh, much of the financial transactions taking place in Africa, the former colonizers are still in control and perhaps shouldn't be referred to as colonizers in the past tense. And now in the 21st century, the global South still struggle, uh, struggles under the determination of the collective West to control its own destiny. Uh, that's difficult to do when the US has more than 800 military bases uh, around the world. The exact number is held as a secret, but the US has at least 29 military facilities in 15 African countries. Uh, France, colonizer of much of the continent, has bases in 10 countries. And that is still a problem for the global South, controlled by US and NATO nations for military control and financial control. These uh, 800 bases should still be the focus of discussion on these issues. If we can use one word to sum up the problem here, that would, word would be imperialism. The doctrine of full spectrum dominance means that the US and its allies are determined to maintain control of other nations and deny them their rights of sovereignty. Um, there's some uh, contradiction here because I think most of us um, are committed to the idea that I'm, I'm hoping everybody here are committed to the idea that all nations are sovereign and can make decisions of their choosing without interference from others. Do we say that more nations should have uh, a nuclear capability? Um, we don't want that, but who makes these decisions? Uh, Iraq, for example, going back to that example, did have an active nuclear program, but it was destroyed by Israel, who bombed their facility. But Israel is a nuclear nation itself and claims the right to destroy such a program, should it emerge in any other country in that region. Israel, like the U.S., didn't ask permission to develop a nuclear program. They just did so. And they are not part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. No one has inspected their facilities and yet they exist. Libya was in the process of developing a nuclear program but gave it up in 2003. Less than a decade later, the Libyan state was destroyed by the US and UK and France and the rest of NATO. Muammar Gaddafi got nothing for uh, his effort to pay millions of dollars in what he thought was protection from the French. And the then French President Sarkozy joined David Cameron in Libya to secure this, this awful victory and in effect to dance on Gaddafi's grave. Thus far, no African nation has attempted to develop a nuclear program, but the argument is made that security comes from having nukes. That's why the Democratic, Republic, Democratic People's Republic of Korea is quite clear that it won't give up its program. It's hard to see why when the US and NATO decree that they have the right to control or contain the whole world far afield from the North Atlantic region, which is supposed to be their area of interest, it isn't hard to see why India and, and then Pakistan would want to have nuclear capability. It's a perverse kind of exclusive club that makes people feel safe from attack. But as I said, we can't separate the issue of nukes from the issue of imperialism. As long as some countries are determined to control others, the desire for nuclear weapons will remain and the exploitation of other nations will go on. Uh, the exploitation to the global south is, as I've mentioned, mostly ex extractive, with not Niger being a source of uranium along with Namibia. Um, other nations 
that are large uranium producers include Russia and Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, as well as in the north in Canada, but also Australia. But who owns the production? Who benefits? There's no documentation on the impact of uranium mining in Congo in the 1940s. Belgium had a particularly brutal form of domination. It's hard to imagine that people working and living, working in and living near the Shinko Lobwe mine were protection, protected. Was the water poisoned? Were workers poisoned? Was the mine ever sealed properly? Are there ongoing health problems or birth defects? Unfortunately, there's no documentation that answers those questions for us. We do know that Congo is a place of conflict because US and European proxies, Rwanda and Uganda, invade at will and steal its resources. Of course, we all want to do away with nuclear weapons altogether. But the US, my country, is the biggest obstacle in this regard, having withdrawn from treaties of many decades and refusing to engage with the Russian Federation, the other major nuclear power. Uh, but we can't, as I said, separate this issue from any other. As long as there's a global pecking order that allows the US and its friends to impose sanctions or start proxy wars or engage in any other manner of intervention, the global South will find it difficult to protect itself in this or any other regard. So we must fight for nuclear non-proliferation against increases in defense spending and fight to close military bases. Uh, I'm a member, as uh, uh, I was introduced, of the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, we say that all organizations must be clearly anti-capitalist and anti-imperialism. Reformism is a dead end. As long as white supremacist structures like NATO and the EU control the planet, we say, quote, NATO is an illegitimate, aggressive structure in the service of Western imperialism and does not deserve any support from African, Black, and colonized people. Moreover, all social forces committed to peace should demand that NATO be dismantled, unquote. And uh, recently, the Secretary General of NATO, Mr. Stoltenberg, echoed what we said with no hint of irony. He said, weapons are, in fact, the way to peace. So the Global South can't be protected from any sort of predation as long as NATO feels that it can declare efforts to contain China or any other countries. And we have to fight against the exploiters uh, here in the U.S. or in your country, in the U.K., where most of you are. But in speaking about nuclear imperialism, the operative word is imperialism. That is what we must fight against with all our might. Um, I just wanted to just honor those people before me. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see um, an image of my late father, Yami Lester, who was blinded by the British tests here in Australia. Um, and these amazing old grandmothers of mine, um, only one of them are living today with us, all the rest have passed. So as the granddaughter and daughter of people who have been impacted by British nuclear tests in Australia, I wanna honor these amazing people who spent a lot of time talking and talking strong um, about what they experienced and their very lived experiences as well. I wanted to um, honour these before me, those who have spoken up quite strongly about this issue um, with these amazing people who had been exposed by the radiation fallout, but continued on then to fight and campaign against other issues that we have here in Australia, such as the waste dump issue as well. And I'll speak a little on that issue um, a little bit um, sooner into the presentation, but the old women formed a group called the Gulbaridi Gungayuda who campaigned against the Australian government's push for a national nuclear waste dump as well. So it wasn't only British nuclear testing, we are also dealing with issues around waste here in, in Australia as well. 
the next slide gives you an idea of where I'm coming from. Um, or I, I wanted to start, I guess, in just honouring my late father, Yami Lester, and start with a quote um, that he remembers very clearly. I was at home with the flu. I was listening to the ABC program AM on the radio. They were interviewing this fellow by the name of Sir Ernest Titterton. And he was quoted in that piece saying that, oh, the black people were well looked after. And my late father's story was the complete opposite of what happened. They weren't taken care of, and that was not the case. And a lot of um, you know, illness and, and sickness fell over that community as well. Um, the next slide gives you an idea of, of where I'm actually speaking from as well. So the slide is an image of the state of South Australia. Um, you see very clearly the railway line as well. And I am coming from a community called Wallatina which is on the very eastern edge of the, what we call it APY lands and where Julia has circled is the community where I'm actually speaking from. And it's quite windy here today or this evening, I should say early hours of the morning here. Um, but this was the very location where my late father and his people felt the ground shake and the black mist roll over the community about three kilometers away from where I'm sitting. Um, and so this is the very location where my people suffered and experienced firsthand the impacts felt by the EMU Fields test and totem one and totem two happened in October, 1953. Um, the image just slightly down from where Julia circled Wallatina, you see the Emu Junction, and Emu Junction is the very location of where those tests, Totem 1 and Totem 2, took place. So as the crow flies, we would be just over 100 kilometres um, from that location, and it was emu fields that had the highest radiation fallout that fell over the Wallatina community. And as I mentioned, many of my people were firsthand um, exposed to the radiation fallout. The, the one concern was that for Aboriginal people who were living within that area in South Australia, um, there was only one patrol officer that was responsible for communicating to the broader community um, and to let them know of the tests that were to take place at Emu Junction or at Emu Fields. And so one patrol office, officer to cover the thousands of square kilometres to inform people of what um, was to take place and the agreement between the Australian government and the British government at the time in 1953. Um, this one patrol officer, of course, only spoke English and many of my people were Yangundara and Buyangara speakers, which are some of the strong languages, two of the strong languages in our state of South Australia, and it's our first language. And so communication was one of the major challenges of informing Arnongo, which is the term we use for Aboriginal people of Buyangara, Yangunyara speaking languages, um, were not really informed of what was about to take place in October, 1953. What we felt and what my people experienced was sickness. As soon as the cloud had fallen over the community, um, many people became quite ill, many vomited, many formed rashes and skin rashes on their um, skins, of course, and blindness. And my late father, Yami Lester, was blinded by the tests. 
In the early 80s, 85, there was a big push from Dad hearing that radio interview of Sir Ernest Ditterton was, I guess, the drive in him after hearing a false statement made by him that people were taken care of um, was the fire in Dad's belly of really bringing the truth out of what happened to Aboriginal people back then in 1953. So that started that journey for the Royal Commission into the British nuclear tests. And it was later found out that Wallaton, a community where I am, had the highest radiation fallout over our community and over our people and created, you know, chaos. Um, you hear stories within our own family history around the panic felt by Aboriginal people. We have a lot of sand dunes around the location and where we live. Um, and that was our only ways of protection was to bury um, many stories we have of our grandmothers digging holes in the sand dunes to cover and protect the children. Um, many thought culturally that there were disturbance of our serpents um, on our traditional lands and the awakening of our serpents. And there was a lot of fear felt by Aboriginal people. And then the weeks, the months and the years that passed as well. So it was a horrific experience felt by Aboriginal people and these experiences are still felt here in Australia to this day as well. The next slide gives you an idea of a lot of the state of South Australia, how we are faced with many uranium mines. Um, the two test sites at Emu Fields and Maralinga um, and just some of the areas where nuclear waste is also kept and a export port from Adelaide as well. Um, and many mines that are mined on Aboriginal people, their traditional lands, um, Atyamatna country. And now we have the, the real fear of nuclear waste dump sites here in South Australia as well. So South Australia has been quite exposed to uranium testing, to uranium mining, and today pressures of the Australian government wanting to find a location for a nuclear waste dump site in the wheat belt of South Australia in a community called the Kimber community, which is on the traditional lands of the Bungala people. And so many of our First Nations family and friends and, and language speakers are impacted by mines, impacted by sites, impacted by ports um, of this substance and, and the results of what um, is made from those uranium that is used to create and, and make these medical wastes or nuclear waste, nuclear medicine and nuclear weapons as well. So we have campaigned for decades now in South Australia against nuclear waste dumps and the battle continues on to this day as well. The next slide just gives you an idea of just some of the issues that we are dealing with here in Australia. Um, of course, with my ambassador's role, we have been working carefully with the Australian government um, to, to sign and, and ratify the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. That's a big part of the work that we do here in Australia is to bring awareness of the impacts felt by Aboriginal people and our First Nations and my family in particular as well is a big part of that story. And also the need to continue to share those stories of those lived experiences to work towards the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The articles six and seven, of course, article six is looking at the 
victim assistance and environmental remediation, which is something really important for us First Nations peoples in Australia. Um, we are looking into a clean up into the EMU fields area, but that work has not started. Um, we are very, um, we are at the very start of that process. And as I mentioned, Australia's national nuclear waste dump is again, a pressure on First Nations peoples of Australia and in our state of South Australia as well. So it was a campaign stood up by those amazing old women who campaigned very hard against the first um, national waste dump in South Australia in the Kimber in the um, Akuna region. Um, and those amazing old women stood up very strongly against that and fought hard for seven years um, to put a stop to that. Um, and then in 2006, 15 to 2017, our state of South Australia decided to also run a Royal Commission into the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, again, needing for First Nations peoples of South Australia to fight another fight and to unite and stand strong with our um, good friends, our anti-nukers in our state and across our nation, our green groups and our faith groups and our unions, our maritime unions crew in, in really setting a strong message to the Australian government of why we were not interested in wanting to have a waste dump, but also, again, campaigning against the whole nuclear fuel cycle and the state's Royal Commission into the nuclear fuel cycle. And so 2017, we were able to put a stop to that Royal Commission and the push of again, finding a waste dump issue. Um, but that has come back to our agenda again. And it's another fight for this year in 2023 to put an end to South Australia's location of a nuclear or proposed location of a nuclear waste dump in the Kimber region. I mentioned briefly about the EMU fields cleanup. We are still at the very early stages, but it is something that is needed um, to take place. And so we are working closely with the defence in Australia as well, and working closely with Maralinga Jaroya, which was um, the community also exposed to the Maralinga nuclear tests in the 50s and 60s. Um, we have close relationships with all of you over there as well, and we've been working closely with Alan Owens around the lab rats and just the recent announcements as well on the recognition and the medal, but also a big part of that work is the need to educate and, and have an, um, an apology as well. As we all know, the British government haven't apologised to Australia, um, but also to First Nations peoples of this country as well. Um, we're hoping to work closely with those involved over there and hearing the stories of our lived experience and the suffering that had been felt by Aboriginal people and from the very location where I am here at Wallatina and the impacts felt by my people, but also this country as well. Um, so that just gives you an idea that it has been an ongoing struggle as you all know, and, and um, you know, people have been campaigning for decades um, it's really important to continue to have those fights and, and stand up strong, as my grandmothers have taught me, to also talk straight out as well, which is something that my grandmothers have taught me for decades now to, to speak up strong about how Aboriginal people were impacted by this and what is needed as we continue on to push the Australian government on the treaty 
from the prohibition of nuclear weapons and looking at those articles six and seven, we need our government of the day to work um, closely with First Nations peoples in this country um, and to work closely to find solutions and ways to move forward for a better future for us um, as First Nations peoples, but also you know, a better future for our country and our traditional lands that are so important to Aboriginal people to this day. And that's a part of you know, my work as I can ambassador mm. and to you know, continue to share those stories as well. So thank you again to organisers for this opportunity to share a little bit of our story from a, a very remote location in South Australia in the far northwest corner is where I'm located. So thank you again. The idea that we need weapons of mass destruction to, to, to maintain um, our influence in the world is one that is completely wrong uh, to me. And that any country should have nuclear weapons is an idea that is completely wrong uh, to me. Now, on behalf of the CND, I attended uh, the first meeting of state parties for TPNW in, in Vienna last year. And I was really pleased to hear Karina's contribution uh, just now because um, at that conference, we began our session on the humanitarian consequences and the risks of nuclear weapons. It is right that humanitarian consequences are put front and center of the debate because sometimes um, even in our activism, we can become quite academic with talk of alliances and treaties and strategies is when the core or core fact of everything that we're fighting for is the protection of people and their human rights. That's why I was also pleased to see such a strong uh, presence of the Black Lives Matter campaign and a strong anti-racist theme uh, throughout that particular conference as, as well. As, as, as we know, uh, for those of us that have been involved in, 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 in campaigning against nuclear weapons, that the movement has been historically a very white movement in terms of activists. When we look at who's been affected uh, across the world, where testing has taken place, where resources have, have been stolen from and caused issues there, it's overwhelmingly people of colour uh, that are affected. So we can't separate nuclear uh, pr proliferation from racism and, and, and imperialism. And I was able to hear the testimonies of uh, survivors, um, the grandchildren of survivors, student campaigners um, and, and others, and, and, and very, very you know, real accounts um, of, of what has happened and the lasting legacy uh, of, of testing where they are. So, for example, we have one man um, who, who, who was born with, with no arms and he came up on stage and explained how his mother never wanted to see him um, and how he... Uh, in his village, there are many orphanages uh, where children were abandoned um, because they were deformed um, on, on, when they were born after testing was taken place. And, and the second and third generation um, generations of people talking about the health consequences that they still suffer um, as a result of, of, of testing from the Marshallese um, Islands. And the, 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 those significant health issues are just as we know with, with things that affect um, a smaller number of people and definitely things that affect people of, of colour, not something that have had a significant amount of, of research. Now, one thing that came up quite clearly as well was, was, was talk of what's happening um, with Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, Russia's ongoing assault on Ukraine is, is, is a completely unjustifiable act of aggression. And we in the international community has to do everything we can can to help bring it um, to, to an end. Uh, but the threat of Putin using potential nuclear weapons has, 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 has also re, really re, reawakened um, our disarmament movement. Unfortunately, the same argument is now being used um, by other countries to justify the stockpile of more weapons. And, and this, this is something that we need to um, remain resolute against. Now, you'd think that having gone through a, a global pandemic, um, that we would have learned the lessons of how wrong it is to be um, and how, how much more difficult it is for us as, 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 as a, you know, a, a, as a people across the globe to be unprepared and how we need coordinated a global leadership and a response. But in response to the potential threat of nuclear weapons, countries are retreating um, and, and very much attempting to look out for uh, themselves and not think about the potential impact across 
the world. Now that there was there was a loud call at this conference for more research um, into into the effects. Um, with the support of the communities affected, because whilst we campaign for, for the removal of all nuclear weapons, we really have to understand what is happening, what is continuing to happen to those communities and what effects um, it has had. And we need to be sure that we are refusing the idea that conflict um, should be a means of solving um, um, conflict. We, we need to see ourselves, or, or we believe rather, that we are evolved peoples, but yet here we are still basing power on who has the most weapons and who can do the most harm to the most uh, civilians. Perceived or real national security threats can't be used as an excuse not to pursue disarmament, and that's exactly what some of the most powerful countries in the world are, are doing at the moment. Um, our end point has to be the elimination of all nuclear weapons. Nobody uh, should have them. And you know those member states that have signed up to the TPNW are using this as a mechanism um, um, to do that. And I think that's absolutely right. Now, the UK, unfortunately, have the excuse that the TPNW uh, undermines the non-proliferation treaty. And that, that makes absolutely no sense, but that's what they and a lot of other countries are, are, are standing in. It was really disappointing to see so when it came to the first uh, meeting of state state parties, but there were other countries who hadn't signed, um, but still attended. The UK, however, didn't send a representative um, at all. Now, the, one of the reasons why this was, this was quite awful because there was a delegation from, from, from Kiribati there. Now, our government have long hidden behind the fact that we only have a deterrent, um, calling it a deterrent as if it has no capability. But, you know, as we've just heard, um, and, and, as, and as most of you will know, uh, in, in, in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, the, the UK actually tested nuclear weapons with devastating long term health and environment, environmental impacts on the countries where it was tested. And they wouldn't even show up to listen to this particular delegation's concerns. Now, in all the places, um, and I cannot think of a single one, but somebody do correct me if I'm wrong, in all the places where the UK tested nuclear weapons, um, in all the places where they have been involved in um, the extraction of national na natural resources, uh, where things have been, where, where people have been exploited, etc. They have neither apologised or offered any sort of form of, of reparations, and they've done all of that in our name. Now we often forget how uh, much more technologically advanced we are. We take it for granted. We send rovers to Mars. We have computers in our pockets, and today we have a panel of people from all across the world and when the campaigns against nuclear weapons began uh, the capabilities of nuclear weapons were horrific but they're nothing compared to what they would be able to do today now it's really really important that we talk about the, the idea of, of, of imperialism we already heard from margaret um just 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 the impact um in in in, in african countries in particular where most of the uranium is is, is extracted from and Thinking of uh, speaking of the TPNW and, and the conference, there were many um, African uh, countries there, and, and others from the global south. Uh, some have signed, um, some have signed and not been able to ratify. And there was much talk, um, uh, you know, the whispers in corners about part of the reason of them not being able to ratify is because they've been threatened on the basis of some trade or development deals. Uh, you know, th these are people that understand what the impact of nuclear weapons could be and want to sign, but are being, again, held uh, by the shackles of, Im of imperialism. Now, I, I, I want to end by saying that we have to be clear that there's there are no peoples and there, there are no leaders by just the virtue of the color of their skin or the country they happen to be born in that have the moral high ground over anybody else when it comes to being able to have um, nuclear weapons. There's only one way that we stop the potential use of nuclear weapons and that is for none of us uh, to have them. And if we don't consider the issues of racism and imperialism that are at play, we are not doing our job as activists. Mm -hmm.